time doesn't change who you are. It makes you more of who you are. So if you want a different future than your present, you have to make the steps and take the actions that's going to lead you there. So oh. that's true in your love life, your finances, your career, your, your spiritual health, all of that. It's our limiting beliefs that ultimately keep us from becoming the best we're capable of becoming. Something's got to change, but that change has to happen first on the inside. It's time to get unstuck. It's time to get your why back. It's never too late. Let's start today. Helping you design your roadmap to wholeness from the inside out. This is Win Today. And now, here's your host, Christopher Cook. Hey, my friends, welcome to the show. Welcome to episode 136 of Win Today. This is your roadmap to wholeness from the inside out. I'm so excited. Spring is on the way. Say it with me. Spring is on the way. What does that mean? The snow is going away. And y'all, the NBA playoffs are coming soon. Dub Nation, let's go. Anyway, I'm glad you're here. We've got a great show ahead for you today. As you heard in the teaser, time doesn't change who you are, guys. Instead, time makes you more of who you already are. Think about that. So knowing your strengths and weaknesses is a critical component of living life on purpose. You know, we all have blind spots, yet making a conscious effort to see and understand them is a challenge few people embrace. You know, I believe that left unchecked, blind spots will sabotage your potential, especially if you're a leader, because unattended blind spots have a compounding negative effect upon the people you lead. It's just true. So what does this mean? At the end of the day, you are in a war with yourself to fight negativity and insecurity, depression, anxiety, self-sabotage, and perpetual bad habits that will keep you from taking your life in the direction you want to live. So today's guest has a lot to say about that very subject, and he has a passion to help you defeat every self-inflicted obstacle in your path. Meet Levi Lusco. Levi Lusco is a best-selling author and pastor of Fresh Life Church, a multi-site church that he founded with his wife Jenny in 2007. But life hasn't always been roses. Despite his success, Levi has had his own share of struggles with anxiety, depression and insecurity, suicidal thoughts, night terrors, and challenges to find victory amidst being a husband, father, and leader to many. But through his own battle, Levi discovered four keys to winning the internal war against himself in order to live a life of lasting significance. Four keys he's going to share with you today. In today's conversation, you're going to learn how to retaliate against your own anxiety by filling your heart with truth and making it inhospitable to terror. You'll also learn how to stop being victimized by your bad behaviors and become the victor you were born to be. Today, you'll learn how to overcome self-imposed isolation by learning to think right so you can live right and spare your family unnecessary heartache by confronting your own dysfunction so they don't have to. My friend, it's time to stop being your own worst enemy and as Levi says, declare war and become the person, the spouse, the parent, and the leader God intended you to be. Here's my conversation right now with Levi Lusco. Levi, it's been a minute, but welcome back. Glad to be here, Chris. Thanks for having me. Hey, you're welcome. It's good to talk to you again. Well, today we're talking about your brand new book, I Declare War, and the subtitle is The Battle With Yourself. That makes me really curious right off the bat. Of all people and things against which we could go to war, why are we in a war with ourselves? What's at stake here? Well, really, it's, it's, it's because whether you, whether you choose to go to war with yourself or not, you're in one. Mm-hmm. I think that's kind of the big idea. And I do want to apologize to your listeners for sounding like my my larynx is being, you know, strangled by a, a cat or something. I've got this <laughs> bad voice issue. But um, really oh, good, man. I think I think Warren Wearsby put it well when he said that the Christian life is not a playground, it's a battleground. And I think a lot of people know that as far as spiritual warfare, you know, I grew up conditioned to like just being aware the devil's everywhere, you know, almost mm-hmm. like just the, he's a roaring lion. He wants to jack you. And I think this hyper vigilance to spiritual warfare is good and definitely necessary. However, what I kind of failed to realize is how much of a problem I am for myself. 
And, and sometimes I think, quite frankly, um, you know, we're blaming the devil and he's up there going or wherever he is. You know, I don't know where the devil is at the moment where he, he's, he's basically going, that wasn't me. That was all you. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't even send a demon to mess with you. You just did that to yourself uh, because we have enemies. Uh, without the world, for sure, Jesus said in this world, you love tribulation. And we do have an adversary of the devil. But the third and most perhaps sinister form of, 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 of opposition comes from our own fleshly nature, our fallen nature. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and even Paul struggled with this. So yeah, to, to, hear, to read of him going, oh, wretched man that I am, what I want to do, I don't do, what I do, I don't want to do. What is he saying? He's not saying that's the devil. He's saying Paul versus Paul. It's man versus himself. And uh, so that's really, I'm calling people to declare war. Basically, you declare war when there's already war happening, and now you're choosing to engage. So there was already a world war happening before America chose to declare war after Mm -hmm. Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. So the war was going on. We just Mm -hmm. finally engaged. So when I say, I want you to declare war on yourself, I'm not saying I want you to start a fight. I want you to acknowledge there is a fight and that God wants you to win this fight. Yeah, that's really good. Well, it seems like fear and panic and anxiety are so rampant today amidst everything that happens internally. Uh, like you just said, I'd love to uh, to dive in and ask you to talk about your own struggles with night terrors and anxiety in particular. Yeah, 100%. Um, most of my life, I've had really difficult times sleeping, um, especially that 2 a.m., 3 a.m. block. It, it mm-hmm. just That's when my mind run, runs amok. And I don't think I'm the only one. Matter of fact, this morning over breakfast, my wife, Jenny, uh, was telling me how hard she had. She, and I wish she would have woke me up, cause, but she was trying to make sure I got rest because my voice. Uh, but she said, yeah, 2 a.m. to 3 a.m. And I was just going crazy. Now, yesterday was one of the greatest days of our ministry life. We got to open up the brand new facility for our broadcast campus. It was oh, a wow. day of celebration and joy culminating in um, literally 10 years of work. You know, we bought up real estate in, in on, on, on three different buildings, tore down a restaurant in between, connected them, and we finally got to open up this so building. Good. And and yet last night, here, here she is, her mind's in knots, she's going through difficulties. And and that's, even though I slept great last night, thank you, Z-Quil, um, yeah. is normally my story. You know, normally it's it's the best of times, it's the worst of times. It's a great opportunity, but I'm, my mind's just a mess, and I'm, you know, having fear and panic, and whether it's fear of something happening to my one of my kids, or you know, or or, or fear that I'm going to do something stupid, or just worrying about finances, or worrying about some relationship that's gone sideways, or why did I say that, or why didn't I say that, and and just being locked up. And I think a lot of times these things. We, yes, there are spiritual um, causes, but I think there's some very simple, practical things we can do that will mitigate against mm. these things. You know, just as I found, victory comes even from just taking control of what I allow into my mind in the final hour or two before I go to sleep. You know, there, there was a day when I'd have Netflix on or have some movie on, and and I've just found if I if the last thing I do before I go to sleep is either something scriptural or something positive or you know, or, or at worst, something like history that I'm reading, um, I find it just really sets the pace for the kind of sleep that I want. And so not just allowing myself in the mindlessness of, of entertainment, but really just taking control. And then also even what I do when I get into those funks, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, there's a few things that, that God's kind of shown me over, over time that if I, if I, if I really, I, I can snap myself out of a funk or a bad mood or a bad dream a little bit faster maybe than earlier on. Mm. Well, I want to stay right there and ask then, Levi, when you're in a bad space with anxiety, how do you typically cope? Yeah, so um, one of the big things is there's a few key scripture verses, and they change over time, but there's two that have been primarily used throughout my life ever since um, God used someone in, to give them to me. And I, I actually share these specifically in the back of the of the I Declare War book. Uh, one comes from Isaiah and one comes from Deuteronomy. And they're basically just scripture verses that I, 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 I grab. I call them my life raft verses. They're the break glass and use these. When I'm really, you know, falling, I'll grab one of them and mm-hmm. I'll begin to recite them, you know, over and over again and really just take myself uh, out of it. So th- this is what, what I do when I really get into those moments. And then I uh, Unlike my wife last night, I will wake her up and ask her to pray for me, or I'll text a, a couple, one of a couple friends who I know a 2 a.m. text won't bug them, and I'll say, hey, will you pray for me? I'm having a low moment. Mm-hmm. Um, but the other thing I found is so helpful is the preventative maintenance side. You know, it's, it's a lot better 
to wash your hands and hydrate than it is to buy all the NyQuil and Sudafed in the world. So what we do before we get into situations is a lot better than getting into them. And, and for me, one example is in the book, I talk about how early on public speaking was very hard for me and mm. uh, very, very hard for me to get up on a stage and talk to people. And I used to throw up every single time without fail. I would wow. puke or I would wow. speak. And, you know, now I'm, that's literally what I do all day, every day. I'll, I'll be on, you know, 15, 20 planes this month doing that. But there was a day when it, I was tortured by it, like nightmares all night, waking up mm. with the sheets drenched. I'd have to put a towel down to get, like, to even get back to bed just from the anxiety of getting to speak. And um, I found that, well, I'll just give you two simple things to help me before yeah, I speak. Yeah. Number one, my posture. You know, they, they have found a correlation in cortisol, which is a stress hormone, in uh, hunched up, um, tortured, hands on your neck, kind of like, you know, or crossed arms. Uh, basically, your body releases a stress hormone when it senses you are assuming a posture of stress and fear. So honestly, you, you will feel like you act. So how you hold yourself. So I make sure if I'm about to speak, you know, I'm, 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 well, I'm not backstage during the songs. I'm out in the front row with my hands held high worshiping, which mm. honestly is not only theologically important, but biologically, it, your hands being raised in, in the air or your hands on your hips like Wonder Woman or just basically standing with a tall ramrod posture, it causes your testosterone rates to spike. So mm. it, God, and why do you think the Psalms say, Raise your hands, O oh you people. Yes. Honestly, you cannot find one uh, time in the Bible where the Bible says, worship God hunched over with your hands on your neck. You know, I mean, it's not just God wants you to have, you know, raise your arms up. And he's telling us how to have the kind of strength, which is why the Bible says, let yes. the weak say, I am strong. It's saying, assume in faith what you don't feel in the moment. So that's number one, my posture. Number two is the words that I speak to myself. You know, you are the, you are responsible for the script that you allow in your head you're the narrator of your of your life story mm. and i think sometimes we allow the narration to be pretty bogus you know this is going to be terrible it's not going to go well you don't know your thing you're not going to memorize your lines whatever it is so before i speak i have some performance statements i had read a book written by a, a high performance a sports coach he he comes in to coach athletes at the highest level of the nba and major league baseball and he helps them you know um, get their psychological game strong because even more than, than physically pumping iron and running lot, the, the laps and all that, uh, playing in, at the highest levels in the Olympic arenas, et cetera, it's, it's a mental game. There, there's a mental toughness that's required. Mm -hmm. And they, a lot of times can, people can succumb to what's called paralysis by analysis, which is overthinking it, getting their head too much into it. So when I read that book, he talked about how uh, there was a baseball player who uh, would say to himself uh, before he would go up to bat or pitch, he would say, uh, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. And he had a couple other different little things he would say to himself that kind of got his mind right. And so I developed uh, basically six lines, six statements, and I give them all in the book. But one of them, for example, for me is when I am weak, he is strong. And the weaker I feel, the stronger I become um, mm. because I'm not relying on my strength. I'm relying on God's. Another one is um, that I'm a son of the king and I have the spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead. So when I'm starting to feel myself uh, succumbing to fear or whatever it is, not only how I carry myself, but how I'm speaking about myself is what I use to change the way I feel. I'm so glad we're talking about the thought life because the first tactic I want to unpack with you is declaring war on our thought life. So the question is, Levi, can we really control our thought life, especially if our life circumstances validate our negative thoughts? Well, if you don't, you're basically giving up the rudder. You know, imagine mm -hmm. a ship where, mm -hmm. you know, you have the sailors out there with the, you know, they're taking care of the cannons and making sure this is great and the sails are trimmed. But imagine if at the steering wheel, uh, the, the wheel at the helm was just spinning, 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 because no one had their hand on it. That's what we're doing. If we're, you know, we're praying and we're reading our Bibles and, you know, we're trying to love our friends. But if we're not really controlling our thoughts, um, because it's astounding. If you Google it and look into it, the amount of negative thoughts the average person has per day, it basically boils down to 1.8 hours of negative thinking for every 16 hours that you're awake. Because most people, you know, sleep about eight hours. So, if you have 16 hours left, 
of the 16 hours, 1.8 hours are spent um, with negative think negative things running into your head. These could be simple things like, oh, what a lame thing, or oh, why didn't I get invited, or, or or more sinister as well. And some studies show that, you know, we have oftentimes shockingly vile mm-hmm. or vulgar or crass things pop into our heads unexpectedly. And you know, I, I'm, a, I'm listen, I'm a pastor, and I'm appalled sometimes at the random thoughts that just pop up into our heads. Yeah, so. Yeah. The Bible never says, you know, you, you, it's a sin to have a, a bad thought. The Bible talks about it's the, the, the sin becoming when you let it marinate, when you let it meditate, when you let it cogitate, and you you, you begin to fantasize and allow it to stay there. Yeah. Martin Luther, the great theologian, said it's not a sin to have a, you, birds fly above your head, but it, it, when you let it make a nest in your hair is when you, you're letting it stay there. Because the perfect example is Bathsheba and David, right? He saw her. He should have kept walking. Mm-hmm. But he began to stare at her. That's where it began to be sin. So, okay, so what I'm trying to say in the book is you can't stop thoughts from showing up, but you don't have to let them put their feet up on the furniture and, you know, get comfortable. If your mind is an airport, you know, you need to install TSA. And so before a thought, um, you know, goes to gate E17 and buys a Cinnabon, you need to basically wand it and, and force it to put its bag through the metal detector yeah. because every thought's a train. And that's why they call it a train of thought. And so before you let a, a thought stay there, you have to ask it, where are you taking me? Are you taking me to insecurityville? Are you taking me to anxiety town? Are you taking me to um, fear USA? I don't mm-hmm. want to go there. So mm-hmm. I'm going to do what the Bible says is my mandate and my responsibility. And I'm going to take that thought captive and I'm going to force it to the feet of Christ mm-hmm. and nothing can, can stand against his feet. So, you know, when you choose to do that, you're actually going to take control of where you're going. Yeah. Well, you made a cornerstone statement in the book, and it's this. You said, nothing so influences your life is your ability to control your spirit in the midst of volatile feelings and the madness of life. Levi, what's the first step to doing that? Because at least for me, when everything's out of control, it's so easy to just lay down under whatever's happening. And I don't like it. That That's exactly right, Chris. I think the first step is to monitor your thinking. You know, if you started to actually just pay attention, because so much of our life, you know, we just kind of go through the motions. We're in cruise control and we're so habituated to negativity yeah. and to cynicism. And especially in our culture, kind of this snide, don't trust anything. You know, everyone kind of is just, it, so I think we, we don't even notice it. Mm-hmm. We're so used to our dysfunction that we don't pay attention to it anymore. Uh, for example, um, in our family, gosh, we have this so embarrassing. Um, we have uh, one of those Alexa plugs that basically is a, a power outlet that is tapped into Alexa so you can use your voice to control that, that plug. Mm. And at one point, uh, that plug was plugged into our Christmas tree. So we could say, Alexa, turn on the Christmas tree, and uh, she would do it. Um, but now, of course, we don't have a Christmas tree in our home uh, because it's March. Mm. And uh, yet, s- somehow or another, a, 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 a floor lamp ended up plugged into that and t- two or three times a day you'll hear someone in my family say alexa turn on the christmas tree and the, that light turns on and we don't think anything of it but we had a guest in our home the other day and they tried to turn that <coughs> lamp on and you know one of my kids corrected him and said no 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 you have to tell alexa to turn the christmas tree on and the look on that person's face was so like why why would you why would you let that be? That's not normal. And all of us just like, oh, well, that's just what you do because we were habituated to our dysfunction and we couldn't even see it because we were used yeah. to it. And I think wow. um, in, in a lot of people's lives, there's some example or another of dysfunction that we've just tolerated so long. Mm-hmm. We've gotten used to it. We don't even see it anymore. You know, We don't even know what true freedom looks like because we've gotten so used to our jail cell. Oh, that's... That's powerful. That's a powerful statement. So what I hear then is that the issue isn't as much trying to control everything that comes in, but instead really deciding to what what to do with those thoughts, with those emotions when they come in. So we're not uh, creating habit out of dysfunction, like you just said. Is that correct? Yeah. I, well, in, and I was saying the, that that's the first step. So the first step is monitor. Monitor and ask right. the question of the, so even if you started to even keep sort of like a, you know, here's a, here's a great, here's a great way to look at it. Um, uh, positive and electric current. Every volt of electricity is positive and electric to, to, to it. So you can tell a battery. For I, Just a minute ago, I was before I jumped on this call, I had to turn something on, I had to put a battery in. And I, of course, made the 
you know, foolish, quick decision to put the batteries in without looking to the little picture, thinking I know where the spring is and where the, you know, little tab is. And of course, when I turned it on, it didn't turn on because I had the positive where the negative should have been. So if you start just paying attention on, you know, throughout the week, as you monitor your thought life, it's okay. As a thought pops in, go, is that positive or negative? Is that demonstrate faith in a big God or a small yeah. God? Does that put me ahead of others? Does that put, you know, is that elevating anxiety? Um, is that fear-based or faith-based? Because look, fear is just having faith in the wrong thing. It's it's trusting, you know, the the, the worst and not the best. It's, is that, put that through the Romans 8 filter. Does that believe yeah. that God works all things together for good? All that. So if you start monitoring it, then you can realize, wow, there is some dysfunction I've tolerated because many of us don't even realize we're doing it because we are, our go-to is negative. Yes. And here's mm-hmm. a perfect example. Um, I've been around people and I've, I've done it myself who something bad happens, right? And what do they say? Story of my life. Mm-hmm. Story of my life. I didn't get invited to that game. Story of my life. I wore white and got ketchup on the dress. Story of my life. Yeah. And, ho- and it's like, hold on a second. Is that really the story of your life? Because if it is, you need to write a better story. And yeah. if you choose to write a story that, that's based on grace, you'll get to say, you know what? Stuff happens, but our God is good. Look at Joseph. Joseph, everything bad happened to him in the world. And he didn't choose to write that as his story. His story was, you meant this for evil, but God used it for good. And I think we need to, if we start paying attention, then choose to start editing and realizing we have edit rights. This document is not locked. It's not read-only. This yeah. document of our life it's not something that someone you know, foreordained for us. We just have to walk in this you know, cursed existence. We get to choose to say, hey, in the goodness of God, I believe, and in his plan, I will trust, and I will meditate on his face, and I'll believe him for good things, and even in hardship, I believe he has a plan. But then you have to, like I said, start taking those thoughts captive. And, and I think also it's important to remember you, you, can't, you can't delete a thought. You have to replace a thought. So you know, your mind is a vacuum. And, and, and I'm sorry, your mind is, is, is like a vacuum and, and it will not ever be empty. So to say, I'm just not going to think about that anymore. That's the way to guarantee you keep thinking about it. So then you choose to replace it with something good, replace it with something noble, replace it with something that's, that's positive. That's good. I want to I want to turn the page a little bit because I know this is a really big deal for people, and that's insecurity. I, I'd love to know um, how does it manifest in your life, and how do we tackle insecurity effectively? I don't uh, actually struggle with that. Joking. Uh, yes, I, <laughs> I I think it is such maybe one of the defining struggles of our generation, especially in an era of uh, public uh, posts on social media that are chronically, you know, edited, filtered, and where we're all putting out there, what we wish everybody would believe is uh, our normal, yeah. you know, uh, we're, <laughs> ministry, you know, it's, it's always the full room shot. It's, this is look how great our ministry is. It's, it's so easy to hide, uh, what do they say? Show your best, hide the rest and to live this fake life and and we're do it's all it does is lead to narcissism, which is the secret to misery. Uh, because the more you're focused on yourself, the less happy and content you'll be. And the more you focus on God and other people, the more you tap into true joy and peace and well being. And in an era where we check our phones, you know, every six minutes on average across this country, that's what they say over 150 times a day, not including when you check it just to see what time it is or if it's a notification, that's actually when you open up the lock screen 150 times a day. Um, Our insecurities are out there just clearly seen, you know, as we all post, do you like me? Do you like me? Do you like me? And then we refresh waiting to see how many people liked. And then, you know, I know people who pull like, I'll pull it down if I don't see likes right away. If I don't see the kind of traction, it's like, my God, what is, what is, what have we become? Oh, it's so true. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. You mentioned that I got to the place uh, about a week ago, I said, I can't do this anymore. So I'm taking the entire month off of all social media just because I could feel it just bearing down on my soul. I'm like, I've got to get free from this. It's so true. You know, um, I think Simon Sinek is the one who said, um, we have laws governing gambling. We have laws governing alcohol. But they have proven uh, that social media and technology mm. in general is more addictive 
than 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 either of those things. My the person who invented the Facebook like button himself said that um, that digital notifications are bright dings of pseudo pleasure, and they have been scientifically. It was on sixty minutes with Anderson Cooper, scientifically proven to light up the same pleasure centers of the brain as a slot machine in the casino and as heroin. So here we have a highly addictive substance. And what Simon Sinek said that chilled me to the core was he said, he was talking to my wife and I uh, in a back room and he said, um, he said, but with, with kids, we would never allow our kids to go into a casino with a bucket of coins. We would never give our kids meth but we hand them a cell phone at 13 and let them have access to Instagram and all this out there. That's not even talking about porn or predators. We're just talking about the positive sides of social Mm -hmm. of of phones, you know, connection, et cetera, but it's addicting and it it shapes uh, a worldview and and what it's done with bullying and what it's done with, you know, all of that with yik yak and all these apps where kids can on campuses just berate each other and, I mean, it is just, and, and, and also just flaunt what they have. And to, you know, if you don't have money, what you don't have. And I yeah. mean, it's just unbelievable to navigate. Now, of course, I'm not saying uh, we should get rid of technology and all move to Montana and, you know, churn our own butter. Because I think Jesus said, be in this world, but not of this world. And I think he gave us the mandate to reach the world. And if we have the World Wide Web, well, then hello, that's a good way to reach the world. And yeah. you know, our ministry, like yours, is accessing homes throughout the world because of technology. So the question is, how can we have the technology without the technology having us? Oh, that's good. That's really good. Hey, well, the next tactic I want to talk about, you know, tactic number one was talking about our thought life. Tactic number two is declaring war on what we say. You wrote that this has been a struggle for you. I'd love to ask why. Oh, gosh, because of me and my big fat mouth. Mm. Uh, Chris, you know, I think, um, I think what, what do they say that uh, under the bottom of any virtue is a double vice? So anything you're good at can be your undoing. David, a man after God's own heart, passionate, what what was his undoing? Passion. So, of course, um, when it comes to, and I wouldn't consider myself eloquent by any stretch of the imagination, but I I know that God has given me a gift of speaking. Um, If I am not careful, that same tongue can be used to do double evil and you know cutting people down and and being rude and being being passive aggressive and having a short temper and letting little snide comments and you know digs uh just speak death and james and proverbs both say that life and death equally are caught up in the power of the tongue so what we choose to do with our words can either create life or it can destroy life and a great example of this is found in in creation when God wanted to create the world, he said, let there be light. And what he spoke informed what was. Well, the Bible also says that we are made in God's image. So what does that mean? Well, that means that our tongues similarly can create. But whether our, our, our tongues give gifts or poison to people and to ourselves is up to us. And I think we sort of know that when it comes to our, our friends and, and, and others around us. But I think we forget how much what we speak impacts our own selves yeah you know um uh i think sometimes when god hears us speaking he says if you say so and i talk about this in the book how let's say you're driving to to work um and you say i hate this town i live in i hate it's so small it's it's the boondocks oh my car sucks uh oh i hate my job my boss is the worst oh my husband didn't pick up the dry cleaning he said he would do it i don't have anything to wear from this meeting Oh, the kids, oh, they, they've left the Legos out again. And all of a sudden, you're just in this this this, this um, mode of speaking that God is sort of is like, well, if you say so, I gave you the gift of, of speaking, and now your tongue is creating a reality that you're going to see. Because mm. they've proven whatever we're, 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 we're staring at is what we steer towards. So you'll see more of it. So now you've spoken that. Now you're going to just, you're going to see every little thing that's done by your annoying coworker. He, he never you know, obviously doesn't use mouthwash and, oh, your boss again took credit for your idea. Now you're just seeing more of it because that's what you spoke into reality. So similarly, you know, you could choose to say to yourself, hey, this town might not be Manhattan, but it's quaint and charming in its own little way. Yeah, this car, hey, it's not Mercedes Benz, but thank you, God, that I have a car. I'm not walking in this cold weather. I don't know how you go. Thank you for the one time my husband did do this. Thank you that he does provide for our family. Thank you that I have a job. And, and on you go. And I, I, I say in the book that God, 
hearing that says, if you say so, with a twinkle in his eye. And now he grants you the power to see even more of his goodness, even more of his beauty. And now the elephant graveyard from the Lion King transforms into the circle of life parade. And there's gratitude in your heart because you've chosen to use your tongue to create life. Hmm. Yeah, I'd love for you to talk about some of your daily startup rituals because <clears throat> to parlay into this, uh, you're talking about uh, focusing on what matters most. And I think that that's kind of set up by our daily startup rituals. I'd love to ask, how do you stay focused early on so that your energy isn't stolen on things that don't matter? Yeah, great question. Isn't that the real, isn't that the real question? How do we start well? Because the way we start, um, it impacts how we, how we, how we get off. Uh, okay. Track analogy. How you come out of the blocks is, is very much telling of how of the race you're going to run, especially in a short distance race. So I look at it this way. If my day, um, has a, a section in it that I have very little, you know, control over nine to five, the average work day. That's if I'm going to communicate with our team, if I'm going to, that, that's the, that's the time that I have the least control over. So my strategy is to put as little as possible in, of my eggs into those baskets. Mm. I think the stress comes from, from people when they try and fit everything into the time that they have the least control over nine to five. is just crazy. That's just bonkers. So I'm not as much worried about that. I know that that's going to happen the meetings and, and all that. that. That's all there. My, my most control that I have over my day is what I ha- what happens from five 30 AM until nine and what happens from, you know, five 30 PM until nine, you know, the, the morning and evening is really what I think about it. So I'm very careful with what happens. I never would allow, you know, this meeting's here at 10 30, my time. That's because, uh, up until that, that 10 o'clock hour, right around that, that morning block is, is what I covet because, that's when I create. That's mm-hmm. when I. That's when I, I meet with Jesus. That's when I um, am able to really. People ask, you know, how do you write a book and all those things? It's all those mornings. I protect those mornings. I wouldn't let anything happen there, and um, and then my nighttime shutdown ritual. You know, dinner with the family. Uh, right now, our family is reci- is learning to memorize the Apostles' Creed. So we all gather and we go through the line by line. I believe in God the Father Almighty, wow. Creator of Earth, and my little daughter is sitting. You know. Uh, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, died. It's the most adorable thing in the world. Um, and, and that's – so the nighttime, being there for those moments, um, uh, we don't have phones at the dinner table. And our se- our seven-year-old Clover is the keeper of the peace. If she sees a phone at the dinner table, she is like, how could you? So you know, those things are really, really matter to me. Um, and then the, the daytime stuff, I feel like if I've had a great evening and a great morning, I'm off to a good start. You know, so – but – but as far as specifically my pregame ritual, when I'm up first thing in the morning, it's immediately as quickly as, quickly as possible. Yeah. It's to my coffee machine. And with a pot of coffee brewing, um, I'm able to then go find my devotional and my, my journal. And I, I immediately do uh, a little quick devotional right now. I'm going through one by Tim Keller. Then I, then I write in my journal about yesterday and maybe a line or two about the, 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 the day today a prayer for something. So maybe I realized, gosh, yesterday I don't like this about myself. I declare war is all about how to overcome the version of you that you don't want to be. So one of the questions that today I asked myself was, when was I yesterday, a version of myself I don't want to be? And now how do I pray about how to not do that again today? And so that's one of my questions. Um, And then um, I also just, you know, uh, go through my scripture reading app. I'm going through an app called read scripture with my wife where we're going to read through the whole Bible in a year. This is by Francis Chan's crazy love ministries. It's free Mm -hmm. app in the app app store. And it takes you through, you know, three or four chapters right now in the old Testament. And then there's little videos, which are cool from the Bible project that that they put in from time to time. And then at the end, it ends with a Psalm. But my favorite thing is the app, right? When you open it, it says, take a deep breath before you meet with God. And I love that. And every time when I see that, I stop, take a deep breath, mm-hmm. and I've got my coffee there. And I, and I feel like mm-hmm. that's my chance to really settle myself in, quiet myself, and get myself ready for the day. And God is so faithful to always give me something to carry that day. So today was, I think, from the book of Deuteronomy, uh, the part that stuck out to me was when God said, I will cause your enemies who come against you to come at you one way, but to flee from you seven ways. Mm. And I'm just holding on to that promise today that anything that comes against me, God's going to be so strong in me uh, that uh, it's going to it's going to be routed and flee from me seven ways. And my unity won't break, but its unity will break. Mm. And so 
you know, now coming into this meeting and all the subsequent things that are on my plate today, I feel like I've become who I am in Christ and I'm not any lesser version of myself. Mm. Levi, I think one of the things I respect about you most is your really apparent level of self-awareness. I can't help but think, especially based upon what you just said about your startup rituals, that self-awareness keeps you in the space of knowing how to say yes to the things that matter most and then prioritizing not only your life, but keeping the things out that are just going to be distractions in your own life. So thanks for that. Thanks for being an example of self-awareness. Well, yeah, and that, that that's a great compliment, Chris, and I appreciate that. And it's born of a thousand mistakes. You know, mm. that was my biggest um uh, blooper and blunder early, especially early on in starting the church. I, I, I made so many messes and so many mistakes and so many missteps. And I drove home from work so many days with regret and walked away from conversations with my wife or my kids just with, oh, why did I do that again? Why did I say that again? And, and it, it, God really opened my eyes to see myself. And, and I, I went through some, um, some great books on emotional intelligence and self-awareness and self-management, uh, a Harvard Business Review, uh, one in particular comes to mind. And I really realized, I did some tests on it because they actually say that your emotional quotient, leadership quotient, which of course includes self-awareness and self-management and all that, they say it's a better predictor of your success in business than your IQ is. And they can actually track um, how well you do on a, on, on a self-awareness and, and emotional intelligence test um, to, uh, every point you add on that is literally like what you'll add to your salary and your earning power long-term in life. And mm -hmm. I think people don't know that thing of, Oh, if I'm smart, if I'm, if I'm, you know, whatever I'm going to do well, not realizing, uh, how important and how much of an Achilles heel it can be that yeah. you're, you're just not socially smart and, and self-aware. And so having some hard moments with God and, and some hard looks at some of the data, has caused me in the past few years to really try and do as much as I can um, to improve in those areas. And uh, it's been a really difficult but rewarding journey for me. Mm. And I think um, I think par partially the problem is we kind of live in this era where the bad boy CEO is like basically praised. Like, you know, Steve Jobs is a perfect example. Yes. Because he was brilliant, he – uh, allowed himself to be just a complete and total tyrant and jerk. And yeah. I think it's almost like there's this misunderstanding that it's, it's not just not only possible, but it's actually preferable to be genius and good, but also to be kind. That's so true. I was on the phone last week with Pat Williams from the Orlando Magic, and we were talking about this exact same example, talking about Steve Jobs and sort of the other side of his leadership that lacked compassion and lacked kindness and that all plays into what we do, Levi. That is tactic number three. Tactic number one, of course, was declaring war on what we think. Tactic number two was declaring war on what we say. And then, of course, tactic number three is declaring war on what we do. What we do is so important, Levi. Drill down on that for us. Yeah, you know, I, th I think it's repeated behaviors. It's, um, it's a willingness to allow the right things to become habits. Um, they, yeah. they, they say that anything you do uh, enough times uh, becomes uh, part of your brain's series of files that it can fire up and execute without you even thinking about it at a certain point. A great example would be how um, you brush your teeth. They say the average person is less likely to uh, brush their teeth staying in a hotel than at home. At home, you probably never forget because you do it in the exact same order at the exact same time, whether you do it before breakfast or after mm. um, I'm an after breakfast brush teeth guy. I don't mind eating breakfast with my teeth unbrushed. My wife, however, can't enjoy her breakfast if her teeth aren't brushed. Um, but but when you're at a hotel, if you think about it, it's like, oh wait, did I brush my teeth? It's almost like it's, you could forget because you're not in your environment. There's no cues. At your home, there's cues that fire up all these different um, uh, files of of repeated steps. So um, what I'm talking about here, here in this third step is figuring out what new habits you need to put in place. So an example for me would be when I'm writing a book, uh, I, I write, um, well, every book's been different for me, but between 1,000 and 2,000 word writing sessions. And I don't wait to get inspired. I don't need to feel, oh gosh, I feel it now. I, if I'm writing, I will write 1,000 words today and I will write 1,000 words tomorrow. And every yep. day that I'm writing is gonna be a day that I walk out of this room with 1,000 words. And I don't need to feel like it was good. I need to 
you know, if, if, if and when the muse shows up, she's going to find me at my desk writing and between these hours and all that. So that's one small example. Um, but date night with my wife is another example. Um, my, my kids, I rotate through daddy daughter trips with my kids. Um, I, my son doesn't come yet. He's only 18 months old. Yeah. And he's not, he wouldn't remember it anyway, but next week, actually this week, I'll take my uh, middle daughter, Daisy on a, on a speaking trip and we will do a half day at Disneyland. So it's inconvenient. It's more expensive. It would be an extra $500 or whatever, but to me it's worth it. So I habituate and then she knows after Clover and Livy, it'll be her turn again. And the point is, um, I'm putting these small things. I'm not just hoping that one day, you know, she'll be 18 and go, I love my dad. I love my life with my dad. I, I know that she's going to look back and see I deposited in, um, uh, into her account over and over and over again. And I, I don't want to just wish for a future that I want. I'm going to actually um, take the right steps that are going to lead me to the life that I want because it's the tiny tweaks that lead to the giant mountain peaks. And so we yeah. get into dysfunction and mess and unhealth one step at a time and we get out of it the same way. But you can't just let life happen to you. You have to happen to your life. And I think sometimes people misunderstand time. Time doesn't change who you are. Because everybody right now listening has some thing they hope of the future. You know, I hope in 10 years, I hope I'm successful. I hope this, Let's listen to me. Time doesn't change who you are. It makes you more of who you are. So if you want a different future than your present, you have to make the steps and take the actions that's going to lead you there. So wow. if that's true in your love life, your finances, your, your career, your, your spiritual health, all of that. Mm. I'd love to ask what happens to your character when we do that, because I know there's a molding and a growing that happens. And, and you had mentioned with your writing habit, uh, you don't wait for the muse to show up. You sit down and you uh, say, I'm going to write a thousand or 2000 words today. Stephen Pressfield talks about that in his iconic book, The, the War, War of Art. Art. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, yeah. I read yeah, the yeah. War of Art. I read the War of Art once a year. It is the yep. most important thing, I think, outside of the Bible I've ever read. I'm not joking. Yeah, I totally agree. So what happens to our character then? When we show up against the resistance, when we don't feel like it, what happens? Oh, I think I think your feelings follow. Okay, so C.S. Lewis talks about how, um, we, we, and I'll, I'll, get, I'll get around about to this, but to the answer directly, but C.S. Lewis says, um, we mistakenly think a lot of times that, that worship is what we do when we feel something, and so we, we sing. I feel God's grace, so I sing to worship. He goes, no, no, no. Worship is not a, f- a feeling expressed through actions. It's an action that develops feelings, mm. okay? So so when we, if you get that paradigm, everything changes because you stop waiting to feel before you do. And, and this is a press, very Pressfield-esque line of thought, of course. Um, we, we, we think, oh, if I feel like I love my wife, I'll love her today. No, no, no. Mm. Love your love your wife is what you do, and then feeling the love is what happens when you do. So as a result of, of of giving my my wife flowers, I will feel the love. I don't feel the love and then buy her the flowers. And and so as we choose to habituate the kind of right things we want to do, righteousness and and, and, and prioritization and integrity and compassion, and we act uh, as a person of empathy, you become the person that you're acting like. And I think this is all over the scripture because the Bible tells us to um, to not act like someone we're not, but to act yeah. like who God says we are. Right. Yeah. Well, hey, uh, in our closing moments here together, I just want to ask you to talk directly uh, to my friends hanging out with us today about unburdening our souls, our souls, our mind, our will and emotions. And a lot of times, at least for me, it can get clogged up with junk and just craziness. But I love how you you landed the plan in your book talking about unburdening your soul. Could you talk about that as we finish today? For sure. My garage right now at this moment is full of boxes. And in the book, I talk about how, sadly, Amazon has brought more boxes into my life than I know what to do with, <laughs> yeah. more than my little dumpster that gets picked up once a week to go to the recycling bin can, can handle. And so sadly, considering it's negative eight out in Montana today, I haven't been doing this as much because I'm too cold and afraid, but um, once a week or twice a, a month, usually I'll load up boxes and I'll take them to the recycling plant and have them recycled. And uh, I started to enjoy the ritual instead of dreading it because I realized, Hey, just like my garage, my mind and my heart get full of stuff too. And so I began to um, use the time that I would take the boxes away 
to sort of take inventory of whatever stinking thinking and rotten feeling had accumulated in my heart and any of that I mean detritus and and just residue I would just sure. sort of give to God and I would drive away from the dump with my car and my garage un, unfettered and my heart similarly emptied and I think it's just important for us to realize yep. we need a regular purging otherwise we'll be over overloaded mm, so good guys Levi Lusco, he's the author of the brand new book, I Declare War. Levi, thanks for being here today. I love when you show up on Win Today. You're uh, just a, a wellspring of wisdom. I really appreciate you. Bro, it, if you only knew how good this show is compared to, I don't, I'm not saying this to denigrate anyone else, but the level of professionalism and how prepared you are. And the, it's so stimulating and engaging. I enjoy it every time. So thanks a lot for having me oh, on. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a cool conversation with Levi. I love the opportunity to talk about things that really keep us from being our very best. And I really hope you gained a lot from that conversation. Again, Levi's brand new book, I Declare War, Four Keys to Winning the Battle with Yourself is available right now. Please do yourself a favor. Go get a copy. You know, one of the most meaningful parts of my conversation with Levi today, and it's how I want to recap the episode today, is this. When he said, don't just wish for a future that you want. Levi said, take the right steps that lead you to the life you want to live. Isn't that powerful? He went on to say that we get into dysfunctional behavior one step at a time, but in the same breath, we get into health one step at a time, which means if you're in a spot that you don't like in your life, do an about face. Begin to make choices today that lead you into a direction that is beneficial for your own life, guys. Levi went on to say, you can't just let life happen to you. Instead, you have to happen to your life. What does that mean? You have to be intentional about your growth and your pursuit of wholeness in every area of your life. It's just the truth. And then to echo the statement that began this whole conversation today, time doesn't change who you are. Instead, time makes you more of who you are already. My friend, listen, there is incredible potential. There is significance upon your life, but you will never realize that if you live encumbered and driven by the anxiety and by the toxic thinking and the dysfunctional patterns that have driven you up until this point. If you don't like where your life is at right now, change the mindset, change the soil. I've said it before, the quality of the soil determines the fruitfulness of the seed. You can plant good seeds all day long into your life. You can read all the books. You can listen to all the personal growth podcasts. Podcast. But if what's inside is fear and guilt and shame and anxiety and living as a victim, those seeds are going to die. Life is too short. I believe in you. Take a step today to change the toxic thinking, to change the stinking thinking, to destroy the insecurity that is keeping you from becoming the best you're capable of becoming. Let's do it. Let's go. Again, the book, I Declare War by Levi Lesko, four keys to winning the battle with yourself. Friends, listen, buckle up. Next week here on the show, Chris Hewitt, author of the book, The Sacred Enneagram, joins me. We're taking an even deeper dive into all things Enneagram. You don't want to miss it. Here's a preview. And and so what we do to cope or to contend with that suffering is we began to build out personality. And and, and personality becomes a a sort of skill set of coping addictions. We wrap this up around, um, you know, in the Enneagram language, a so-called childhood wound. And we do this so that we don't have to tell ourselves the truth about who we really are because we would rather stay asleep. We would rather build out scaffolding around the projection of our own ego mythology and not have to sell ourselves the truth, Mm. not have to remember what is our our purpose for being here. And and staying asleep is easy. I mean, I, I don't know very many people who love to wake up and jump out of bed the first thing in the morning. It's like... You, you want to stay under the covers. You, you want to hit the snooze. Like there, there's something about those, those sort of fuzzy, hazy moments between slumber and, and awakeness that, 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 that push and pull us. And, and I think the Instagram sort of shows us what that push and pull is. That's next week, right here on Win Today. Chris Hewitt's author of the book, The Sacred Enneagram. Really excited to share that with you. And hey, listen, for all of you that have written a review or rated Win Today on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, I just want to say thank you. It means so much to me that you would share your heart and share your voice to let other people know how this show is making an impact in your life. And if you haven't done so already, I'd love it if you would. Again, just go to the Apple Podcast app or iTunes and you can leave your rating and review today. It'll take less than 30 seconds. 
Until next week, let's hang out on social media. I'm at 00ChrisCook on Instagram, on Twitter. I'm on Facebook, ridiculously easy to find. And of course, wintoday.tv for blogs and archive podcasts, all aimed at helping you design your roadmap to wholeness from the inside out. Have an awesome week. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.